Okay, well, good morning. Bonjour. Welcome to the eighth session of Guillaume Online, Art and Image. Bienvenue à la huitième présentation du projet Guillaume Virtuel. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that even though we are meeting in the indefinable space of the internet, we are tied to our particular places. McGill University is situated on the traditional territory of the Canyon Cahaca, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. We recognize and respect the Canyon Cahaca as the traditional custodians of the lands and the waters on which we meet today. My name is Victoria Dickinson. I'm the convener of the Gwilym Project, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this event. For those of you joining us for the first time, this is the eighth session in a series of nine webinars exploring the unpublished correspondence and artwork of Lady Elizabeth Gwilym and her sister, Mary Simons. The two women moved to India in 1801 when Elizabeth's husband, Sir Henry Gwilym, was appointed a puny judge in the Supreme Court of Madras. The Gwilym Project, Women, Environment, and Networks of Knowledge and Exchange in the company Raj, is a research initiative of the Rare Books and Special Collections branch of the McGill Library in Montreal. It is funded through the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and the Shastri Indo-Canadian Institute. The Blacker Woodit collection in Rare Books at McGill holds the paintings of birds, fish, and flowers by Elizabeth Gwillem. Mary Simon's wonderful portraits and landscapes, which you'll see today, are held by the South Asian Collection Museum in Norwich in the UK. And the sisters' rich correspondence to family and friends is in the British Library. This project brings together not, not only virtually the Gwilym Archive, which is scattered, but also an international network of scholars from diverse fields in Canada, the UK, India, and the United States. A special welcome to the members of the research network who are joining us today. We'd like to thank all those who have made this event possible, in particular, Dr. Anna Winterbottom, our symposium coordinator, and Lauren Williams, the Blacker Wood librarian. They'll be watching the chat today, and if you have any problems in viewing the webinar, please send a note in the chat. This webinar is being recorded, and you will be able to view it later on YouTube. We'll be sending the link as well as information on our upcoming and final presentation in Gwilym Online to all who registered today. It's my pleasure now to introduce the moderator for today, Jennifer Garland, the Assistant Head Librarian of Rare Books and Special Collections at McGill. Jennifer received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from a celebrated Canadian institution, the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in Halifax, and her Master in Information Science, Science from an equally storied university, McGill. In addition to her role as Assistant Head, Jennifer is also the Special Collections Liaison Librarian for the Blackadder Louderman Rare Collection of Architect Architecture and Art at McGill, the Print Collection, and the John Bland Canadian Architecture Collection. She has been an extraordinary help to our work on many projects in the Blacker Wood, and not the least of which is her collaboration on the Gwilym Project. Jennifer will introduce our panelists and will be posing your questions to the speakers at the end of their presentation. Please use the chat function to ask your questions. Thank you for attending. Je vous souhaite bonne conférence. Jennifer, over to you. Thank you, Victoria. It's my pleasure now to introduce today's four speakers. The first of our presenters is Dr. Ben Cartwright, collection curator at the South Asia Collection Museum in Norwich and the South Asian Decorative Arts and Crafts Collection Trust. Ben works on projects in South Asia and in the UK and is currently finishing a book that documents his time spent following in the footsteps of the 19th century artist, James Bailey Fraser through the Himalayas. He is co-author of two books on the vernacular furniture of Northwest India and curator of numerous museum exhibitions, including Topographical Prints of India, Nancy Jane Burton, and Beyond the Villages, Adivasi Art in India, now available on the museum's collection website. In today's presentation, Ben will introduce the Madras album, a collection of 78 watercolor paintings by a circle of artists, including Mary Simmons and Elizabeth Gwillem, now held at the South Asia Collection Museum. The album provides a unique view on the sisters' life in Southern India, the people, the places, wildlife, and the plants that engaged them, 
The watercolors include street scenes and country retreats, including the tragic Mr. Webb's Cotton Farmhouse at Pommel, where Lady G died. There's also a glimpse into the interior worlds of the sisters. For example, the Miss Simmons drawing room. Today's presentation will explore how the painters of the Madras album might have been influenced by paintings and prints from India at the beginning of the 19th century, and in particular, the rich melting pot of art in the South. I'd like to welcome Ben Cartwright. Over to you, Ben. Thank you, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. So my name is Dr. Ben Cartwright and I'm going to introduce you to the Madras and Environs album, which is held at the South Asia Collection Museum in Norwich. I'm going to introduce the album and then briefly try and place it in a broader context about India and Madras in the early 19th century. And I want to stress that this research is at an early stage. I'd also like to thank the Paul Mannon Centre for Studies in British Art for supporting my research in this project. The South Asia Collection is a museum that celebrates the arts, crafts and cultures of South Asia and neighbouring countries. Please do visit our website and find out more to see collection highlights and online exhibition content. The Madras and Environs album is a collection of watercolour paintings painted by the sisters Mary Simmons and Elizabeth Gwillem and another unidentified painter. The images range from intimate household scenes through to views taken on the streets of Madras, now Chennai, landscape and architectural studies, village scenes and portraits, as well as stylized compositions depicting people in and around Madras in the early 19th century. 78 watercolors have been arranged in a hardbound album with marbled end papers. The paintings have been fixed by adhesive at the corners. Smaller images might have appeared two to a page with larger paintings taking up a whole album leaf. Pencil inscriptions have been arranged uh, like exhibition labels describing what the, what's in the painting, and they've been added beneath many of the paintings. Some of the pictures also have inscriptions on the reverse. Some of the watercolours have a date written on them. The earliest date is 1804, and the latest is 1808. And some of the watercolours also have been initialed with the initials MR. The name of the album, the Madras and Environs album, could be a, des a descriptive title given to the work long after its creation. When the album came into the museum, some of the pictures were partially loose. The Lee trustees at that time took the decision to remove the watercolours and to have them individually framed. Part of my goal in this project is to try and remap the original album so that we can study it as a curated whole. Mary Simmons and Elizabeth Grimm are both name descriptions in the album. Extracts in the sisters' letters describe what they were painting match some of the pictures in the Madras album. It seems likely that MR stands for Mary Ramsden, the married name that Mary took after she tied the knot with John Ramsden, captain of the Phoenix, the ship that carried Mary and Henry Gwillen back to Britain from Madras, arriving in May 1809. Pictures in the album include images from that voyage home, the Cape of Good Hope, dated 1808, St. Helena, James's Town, and Ascension Island in the South Atlantic Ocean, which is also dated 1808. So the curation of the album occurred, at least in part, after Mary's time in Madras and her sister Elizabeth's death. And one of the things that I'm researching is the idea of remembrance and looking back in this form of keepsake. Many of the paintings in the Madras album give us a really personal look at the sisters' lives there. The inscription on the reverse of this watercolor reads like a tour. The tall figure is the bowman. The white dog is our dog lady, a great pet of young and of mine from her gentle nature. The boy leading her is the Maratta. The building in the background is part of our habitations. The next are the offices. The scene in the distance is a large tree the natives call Colonel St. Ledger from his having planted it. This picture is labeled front view of St. Tomé House near Madras. This was the Madras home of the sisters and Sir Henry Gwillen who was a judge at the Madras Supreme Court. And here we have a close up of Sir HG's bedroom and the Miss Simmons drawing room, that is the drawing room of Mary Simmons. The Madras album also includes images of life beyond the European drawing room. Here we have the domestic offices. 
In a letter from 1801, shortly after she had arrived, Mary describes this building. We can sense how new and intriguing she found her surroundings as she got used to them. And I quote, the kitchens and other offices are built a little distance from the house. These people are very excellent cooks, but they have a very odd way of cooking. They light a fire of sticks for roasting and the spits are turned by boys who are apprentices to the cook. The boiling is generally done over charcoal fires, which are lighted in earthen pots and stand out in the garden on any convenient place. They boil and stew everything in earthen vessels, which they have of all sizes and various pretty shapes. And you can actually see a cooking fire in, in this picture. The pictures also take us a lot closer to the staff in the house than perhaps was normal for painting at this time. This watercolour is of a lady's maid, a pariah woman. Both sisters had a lady's maid, women who helped the sisters dress and care for their clothing. It was an intimate relationship, but a clearly defined working one. Maids like this were often from lower caste communities. In her letters home to her mother, Elizabeth describes her maid Popper in great detail and with affection, as well as occasional frustration. And although we don't get Popper's voice, the letter and this painting give us a sense of character for the maids to Elizabeth and Mary, and it remains possible that this picture is of Popper. Like many ladies' maids, Popper was from the lower castes. For years, she had fought to learn the English language as a, means to as a means to improve her lot and provide for her child. By the time Popper had arrived in Elizabeth's service, she'd already been married twice. When Elizabeth questions Popper about this, Popper says she does not want another man, all she wants is to be allowed to visit her child. Popper slept on the hard floor in the room next to Elizabeth's with bricks for a pillow, even though she'd been offered carpets for her comfort. She slept in her muslin clothes and gold necklaces. Henry Gwillem, who was presumably working late on his papers, called out several times a night for toast and, as Elizabeth writes about Popper in 1804, she always jumps up in good humour and appears in full dress, as that requires nothing but shaking herself. At five in the morning, she smokes her cerute of strong tobacco, and when her work is done, reheats it and basks under a tree asleep on the ground in the best clothes I can give her. Because Sir Henry was a judge at the court, the government at Madras allowed him two chobadars or mace bearers. These men would attend on Henry, carry letters, and then stand by the door when he was at home. Elizabeth writes, these are always musulmans in the Morris dress with large tall silver sticks in their hands. And here we have an image of bird catchers. Over the years, the sisters employed a variety of means to catch a birds for Elizabeth to paint. In 1803, Mary wrote that bird catchers bought them birds, that when the birds are brought in alive, they stare or kick or peck. And poor Betsy was often frightened out of her wits or fearing a bird standing still might be ill. Elizabeth took pity and lets them fly before they're finished. Soon they employed a venerable looking old moorman who caught the birds and secured them in a piece of cloth, then later held them in the right posture for Elizabeth to draw. In 1805, Elizabeth wrote home about a couple of shooting men who go upon the hill and collect me curious birds. Mary writes that the grounds of their home were full of tethered birds, including cranes and storks that needed to be fed hundreds of frogs and fish. Serafina will talk more about Elizabeth's bird painting in a moment. The paintings seem to include the arc of the sisters' lives in and around Madras, and that includes Elizabeth's tragic death in 1807. This painting has the inscription, Mr. Webb's Cotton Farmhouse at Pummel, where Lady G died. The album also includes numerous views of the environment around Madras and the city streets. This is the rustic horn. Although Elizabeth was fascinated by the all night ceremonies at local shrines, she could never quite grow to love the music, which she described as, more horrible than any noise was ever heard and intolerably loud. Here we have palms near sacred buildings. There are also a number of highly composed and stylized images in the album. This slide has the inscription seen from a Sanskrit drama. Sir James Strange, the, the brother of the Chief Justice Thomas had seen some of Mary's paintings and she writes, requested me make him some little sketches from a book which was translated by Sir William Jones. He is going to send it home as a present to his sister-in-law. William Jones, who was a member of the Asiatic Society in Kolkata, made several translations from Sanskrit, including Gita Govinda and Laws of Manu, but his most famous work, which was published across Europe, was the translation of Shakuntala, 
a Sanskrit drama by Kalidasha about Queen Shakuntala. Jones published in 1789 and it had a huge impact on the art scene in Europe. By 1791, Goethe noted, when I mention Shakuntala, everything is said. The Madras album also includes portraits of people Mary and Elizabeth would have seen around Madras. Here we have Pandaram, a religious mendicant. We're showing the landscapes around Madras, especially wetlands, which is incredibly interesting when we're thinking about environmental change over time. There's attention to detail, pandanus tree, sort of breadfruit. And here we have in the Mysore. The album also contains a number of street scenes, probably by Mary. These are an incredible record of life in and around Madras. We can really feel the hustle and bustle. Elizabeth wrote home in 1803 to her sister Hetty and may have referenced this very painting by Mary. She wrote, you will see a group of young pandarams. These pandarams are very well drawn and so are two Brahmins sitting down in the same piece. Elizabeth wrote that Mary's street scenes are by much the best things I ever saw to give an idea of the people in the streets or roads here in crowds and so various in their dresses. Mary also invented a form of painting on pasteboard with the idea that she could prop the images up to create a view as if you were passing down a busy Madras street. This Hannah will talk about shortly. This picture carrying an Englishman feels almost satirical. In 1801, Elizabeth wrote about Henry Grillam's new palanquin and noted, you never meet an English person but in a carriage or in a palanquin. The following year, she writes about dinners where guests would arrive in palanquins and each palanquin has from nine to 13 men and two lantern men. These set the palanquins under trees and lie down to sleep or talk till they're called. And they all together form very pretty groups under the trees. The album also includes a number of duplicate images. These include the tragic picture of Mr. Webb's cotton farmhouse at Pummel when Lady G died and these pictures. It's tempting to think that some of these pictures represent the two sisters sat side by side painting the same scene, but more work needs to be done before we can be certain. Now, I'd like to think a little bit about these watercolours as a moment in time in the early 19th century, and to try and work out what art the sisters might have been picking up on and have been inspired by. We know a little bit about their techniques and how they were constructing images. The key details were drawn first, delineated, often with a pencil, and the backgrounds were applied in washes. Both sisters were still in contact with the artist George Samuel, who had been their tutor, sending him gifts and paintings. For example, in 1802, Elizabeth sent a cut section of a gown shawl home and asked her sister Hetty to have a waistcoat made up and sent with some vellum stones to G. Samuel with my compliments and mentions that she is working away after his manner in backgrounds to my birds. George Samuel had suggested the sisters try using Chinese brushes and colors but Mary writes that they were unusable. The constant need for good paper and cakes of watercolours from brands like Reeves were a constant topic in their letters. Mary misses having George Samuel's instruction, writing how hard it was to get good advice and going on a little bit of a rant to her sister Hetty saying, I'm quite mad at myself for not being able to do skies and backgrounds and it is very hard work to find things out without instructions. Mary bemoans the fact that European girls around them think of nothing but husbands and are no good for advice. Instead, they tell Mary how they've received this or that gift from this or that suitor. Pearls and diamonds were the topics of conversation, not paint. Mary writes to George Samuel for tips and advice and asks where to require glasses for miniatures of different sizes to cover the portrait she was painting. They start up a correspondence, often via Hetty. In 1805, Mary writes, we have been this cool season at a place called Pommel about 12 miles from Madras. The country around about it is extremely pretty and I've made myself busy sketching. So you may now tell George Samuel in answer to his inquiries that I've got pagodas and chalk trees and mosques and mausoleums, but alas, no paper for landscape. And in 1806, she tells Hetty, I have sent George Samuel two or three little scraps with a request that he will give me a little instruction. We know a little bit about some of the art objects that Elizabeth and Mary were exposed to. In 1805, Elizabeth writes to Hetty about a miniature album she's been given. Mr. Keene has given me such an exquisite, elegant book. It is a manuscript and contains above 700 pages 
and borders of scarlet, blue and gold intermixed round every page besides various paintings of Hindu stories. In 1806, Mary writes to Hetty and discusses using a print as a model and trying a new technique, the application of body colour. I've been trying to work in body colour a little lately and I send you a specimen of my performance in a copy I've made of a holy family from a print. Mary had started painting the portraits of female acquaintances. She writes to Hetty in 1802, I am become a miniature painter. Don't laugh. I have finished one lady's portrait. I have two more in hand and 20 petitioners praying to be drawn. But the craze didn't last. The next year, Mary writes that she hadn't made any miniatures for a long time, partly for want of proper materials and partly because it took up so much time. Sir Henry Gwillem was not in favour of this new pursuit. Mary writes, Sir Henry said it was nonsense. My time drawing a parcel of foolish conceited girls instead of drawing natives and other things of this country, which my friends at home want to see. Now, to understand what the sisters might have been influenced by, I'm going to briefly look at currents in art in India at this time. To start with, I'm going to turn to topographical prints. William Hodges was the first professional artist to be given an East India Company salary in 1780 and invited to depict the country by his friend and patron, Governor General Warren Hastings. These images are full of the idea of the picturesque. The viewer forever seems to be stumbling up from among trees and shrubs onto an architectural ruin or temple or fortress. His pictures were published in Aquitaine's select views in India. The uncle and nephew, Thomas and William Daniel, arrived in Kolkata in early 1786. It was viewing a copy of Hodges' views that inspired Thomas and William to begin three epic journeys to northern India, the south, and then the west, lasting between 1788 and 1793. The result was a series of, set, of a set of prints called Oriental Scenery, which continued to be produced into 1816. This print is number 19 from the second set of Oriental Scenery from their journey south. This view is in Tamil Nadu. The Mysore Wars brought thousands of troops to Madras in the 1790s. This, the conflict with Tipu Sultan created insatiable appetite for news among European subjects. This was the period that the military memoir became a bestseller and accounts of prisoners in the hill forts across Mysore were commonly read. The Mysore Wars also created a genre of art, the art of soldier artists like Alexander Allen, pictured here on the right, Robert Holm, Robert Colebrook and James Hunter. Alexander Allen was a surveyor. We can see that in this watercolour the skills at delineation he would have learned or have been taught at the East India College back in Britain before his posting. These images of hill forts were meant to be read. Much of the art from this period appeared with text. The viewers would have known the accounts of the battles, the prisoners, the tigers and other deprivations. It was in the popular press. While Alexander Allen could take you on a battlefield tour, the groups of sepoys in the foreground of his pictures reminding you that this was a military view, James Hunter's picturesque scenery in the Kingdom of Mysore was different. There's a quietness to these images, something Rosie Diaz calls an, elegi an elegiac silence. An air of remembrance seems to hang over the pictures. Colonel Francis Swain Ward had his old painters turn into a series of prints, along with works by William Daniel in 24 views in Hindustan, drawn by William Orme. What I'm trying to show here that the sisters were picking out images that were known pictures of India. They probably had seen pictures and especially prints of India before they traveled. They were already common in Britain and certainly once they had arrived. It was also common for Europeans to make watercolors of Madras residences. I think of images like this picture of Daniel's banyan tree, a bit like a guidebook. These pictures created an idea of, of India, of what was worth seeing and painting in India. This influence is in the sister's painting of this banyan tree and Mary's paintings of architecture in a topographical style. Along with other works, the sisters were painting images that would match their viewers' expectations, images that other artists focus on also. Madras had no natural harbour, arriving by Masula boat being pitched through the surf remained a great talking point in, in memoirs and travel literature well into the 19th century. <laughs> 
We know that Elizabeth was given an album of miniature paintings and in the use of flat backgrounds, some of the paintings in the Madras album resemble what have come to be called company school or style pictures, works created by Indian artists for a European market. This picture of a panda, a pandaram comes from Tanjore. Tanjore had become a protector to the East India Company in 1773 with a garrison of troops stationed there. Now Charles Gold in his Oriental drawings published in 1806 included a print of a lame beggar and his family which had been painted by a Tanjore artist. Gold wrote, the Muchis or, or artists of India usually paint in the style represented in the present drawing. On the suggestion of Europeans, some of the country artists have been induced to draw a series of the most ordinary castes or tribes, each picture representing a man and his wife, with the signs or marks of distinction on their foreheads, and not in their common, but holiday clothes. At this time, a visitor to Sri Rangran Temple could buy a painting of the temple from local artists outside to remind them of their visit, and it was common for Europeans to collect albums depicting trades and occupations. Local artists who worked on more specialist projects. Uh, local artists also worked on more specialist projects. In Tanjore, Sir Foji II, the Raja, embarked on an extensive survey of flora and fauna using local painters to create a record. And in 1811, the governor of Madras, Mount Stuart Elphinstone Grant Duff, commissioned Ranjir Raju on a two-year project painting local plant species. The portrait artist George Chinnery was in Madras from 1802 to 1807, Written accounts tell us that he was the most popular portraitist there. Most of his portraits are watercolour miniatures, a market that Mary briefly entered. But we shouldn't rule out the potential influence of Chinnery's love for rural and street sketching, for sketching from life, moving away from the more engineered images of the soldier artist and much closer to a form of documentation. And here you have Englishman in, in, in a palanquin, which is an obvious uh, link to the picture I showed earlier. To think about Mary and Elizabeth, their approaches and how they fit into contemporary art practices, I think it's useful to compare them to Charles Gold. I'm going to use the example of Durbashes, Brahmin men who had mastered English and other languages and acted as translators, middlemen and confidants of many European settlers in Madras. In his Oriental drawings of 1806, Charles Gold describes Durbashes as a respectable caste of men who had fallen on hard times. He called them cheaters, who is all the Europeans they attach themselves to. But Elizabeth Gwillem, writing just two years before Gold's prints were published, had a very different view. As for my Derbash and Polly's, they never leave us. By the way, I must mention that nobody who has not been in a country like this can imagine what an immense time is spent for want of language. Translations by a translator imperfect in the language are fatiguing always. And how can any man be perfect in them? Instead of one Derbash each, we ought to have half a dozen. These men generally write three, but they speak four languages. Yet our lads that come out knock these fellows about if they have made the least mistake and call them stupid, ignorant, degenerate savages. And all this to lads of their own age who sit down and correspond in three languages and translate in four, whilst they cannot correctly write their own. I think this difference tells us a lot about the sisters and their approach to art. For military artists like Alexander Allen, their paintings encapsulated the sublime because of the horror and shock they exhorted in viewers who knew the military stories. This vicious history was evoked to tantalize audiences. But in the Madras album, we find something a lot softer at play, something much more sympathetic. Thank you. Um, I'm now gonna hand back to Jennifer. Thank you, Ben. Uh, for introducing the album, you've really woven together the sisters' Madras experience through their, their images and their correspondence. Now from the South Asia Collection Museum to the McGill Collection, our next two speakers are research assistants on the Gwillem Project at McGill. First, we'll hear from Serafina Masters. Serafina earned her bachelor's degree in art history and classical studies from Smith College. And for her graduate thesis at McGill, she focused on the history paintings of Angelica Kaufman in 1770s England. Her experience with this time period and the work of female artists now informs her work in studying Elizabeth Gwillem's watercolor paintings of birds. Serafina's talk today will briefly detail her process in the conceptualization and creation of a style guide for the watercolors held in the Blackerwood collection at McGill.
as well as examining three relevant artists for comparison. Following Serafina, we'll hear from Hanna Nikcevich. She's an art history master's student at McGill, researching articulations of ecological loss in contemporary art. Her interest in humans' historical interactions with and representations of nature led her to the Gwillem project. Hanna's presentation today takes up four of the watercolors that we saw in the album presented by Ben. These are four watercolors by Mary Simmons, unique in the Madras album, four street scenes depicting rows of various Indian individuals engaging in an assortment of everyday activities. Welcome, Serafina and Hana. Over to you, Serafina. Thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction. Let me share my presentation and we can begin. So coming to the Gwilym Project as a research assistant this summer, one of my main tasks was to create a style guide for Elizabeth Gwilym's paintings of birds. I thought a great deal about how to characterize such a diverse, diverse corpus of works and compare it with those being created before and contemporary with it. Sorry. So since there exists such a great deal of variation within the 121 paintings of birds by Elizabeth Gwilym, I ended up with less of a precise style guide and more of a thorough curated set of characteristic attributes against which one could compare a potential Gwillem. This became my mode of thinking because we know that Elizabeth Gwillem painted approximately 200 works, but the Blacker Wood Library only possesses the 121, about 60% of her possible corpus. The idea of Gwillem birds existing elsewhere in the world brought me to a type of style guide that could perhaps one day help to attribute lost works to Gwillem. So for example, one could bring a potential work to this guide and see if specific features such as the depiction of coconut palms or feathers is a match. This guide is by no means exhaustive and remains a work in progress as I spend time with the paintings and immerse myself further in Gwillem's world. So very briefly, I'd like to remind the audience of some of the basic characteristics of Gwillem's paintings that we learned this summer and a bit about her process too. So Elizabeth Gwillem painted the birds first, and we can see this in their fully articulated feet, claws, and toes, as in these two pictures. As Ben mentioned, bird catchers sourced the animals for Gwillem, bringing them to her alive and telling her of the habitats in which they were found so that she could accurately depict them in their own personal backgrounds. Said backgrounds, as reported to her, were added later in the process in the style of her landscape George Samuel. Samuel's career is a bit obscure, but two of his watercolors seen here on the right contain a few characteristics that we can see in Gwillem's painting on the left, such as the dark textured nature of the vegetation and the round flesh pink clouds. When Gwillem does paint a fully articulated background occurring about 46% of the time, one common feature is palm trees, which we can see here, differentiated between coconut and palmyra palms, each with their own unique mode of depiction. Another reoccurring feature in Elizabeth's full backgrounds are these buildings, which are mainly the pagoda temples that populate the landscape of Madras. These are close-up screen captures of what are relatively small details in the backgrounds of her work. Gwilym also paints a lot of partial backgrounds, and these have some defining, if difficult to describe, features. And so what I have here is a sort of light, flat watercolor ground featuring sketchy horizontal brushstrokes comprising of sand or dirt upon which a bird is stood. These appear to be quickly made, perhaps due to a dearth of habitat details or materials on Gwilym's part. We know from the letters that the availability of paper, paints, and brushes was subject to the inconsistencies of ocean travel from England to India. And Gwilym herself notes that if she were to paint all her backgrounds in the style of George Samuel, she would run out of colors to do so even faster. And so moving from the background features to the avian subjects themselves, the most consistent trait in Gwilym's birds is her depiction and placement of their feathers in such a way that shows an unprecedented understanding of avian anatomy. This is a subfield of ornithology called pterilography the descriptive science of plumage and the arrangement of the feather tracks on the bird's skins. 
So pterilography attends to how feathers specifically overlap on the bird's body to cover bare, flexible skin, since birds are not actually fully covered in feathers in the way they may seem. This detail, uh, this varies greatly and is actually different from species to species. Gulm's affinity for this exacting visual detail was noted by Canadian ornithologist and artist Terence Short, who claimed that no artist before 1800 had demonstrated the kind of intimate understanding of pterilography that is revealed in the Gulm birds. The slides included here are very limited examples, as this is really characteristic throughout Gulm's entire uh, corpus of works featuring birds. So for some examples of her pterilography details, with this owl, we can see the underside and layering of the tail feathers, as well as the unique pattern on each feather, which are both such specific details to include. This speaks to Short's belief that Gwilym must have truly studied the birds as she painted them to receive such natural and accurate postures. I imagine that with the help of that venerable looking old moorman who turned the subjects in proper attitudes, as mentioned in Mary's letter in Ben's presentation, Gulen was thus able to observe and capture all the relevant details of a bird. Similarly here, we can note the overlapping wings and tail feathers, as well as the smaller, finer feathers in the less immediately visible parts of the bird. Gulen depicts multiple different types of feathers in specific locations and relations to their function, to one another and to the overall anatomy of the bird. And here we can appreciate the attention to the coloration of individual feathers in accordance to their placement on the bird. Indeed, I have found that we can best appreciate Gwilym's fine attention to detail in comparison to the illustrations of Gwilym's predecessors. Having spent the first term of my research looking very closely at Gwilym's work and life in Madras while she was painting her birds, the partial results I've just summarized for you, I then turned my attention to gathering a visual list of natural historians, artists, and authors whose work preceded and might have influenced Gwilym. The first two artists I have chosen to discuss today are those that Gwilym mentions by name in her letters, and the third artist looks forward to the future of my research. So Mark Catesby was an English naturalist working about 50 years before Gwilym. His book, or series of books, Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands, published in multiple volumes from 1729 to 1747, was very well regarded and known, as evidenced by Gwilym's reference to it when she mentions, quote, the Pondicherry Eagle, there is a print of the first bird in Catesby's Carolina. If you should meet with that book, it is called the White-Headed Eagle. So here she's referencing Catesby's description of a bald eagle on the left, which we know is very much a different bird from her own Pondicherry eagle seen on the right. So both of those eagles and these two vultures pulled from Gulen and Catesby's work for comparison are different species, but they serve to illustrate the differences in styles and media between the years and the artists. Catesby's birds are much more solid in the body and certainly lack the attention to detail and definition of feathers that characterize Gulen's birds. As was the case with the majority of natural history publications in the 18th century, the final illustrations of Catesby's book were prints. Hence, when compared to Gwilym's delicate watercolors, a great deal of the visual difference is owed to that of the medium. However, I still find this a valuable comparison to make, as these were the very birds that Gwilym looked at as she was making her own, and she used Catesby's book to try to understand the birds she saw in Madras, even if she did so incorrectly as is the case with the Pondicherry and bald eagles. A more contemporary peer, and one that Gwilym also mentioned, was Thomas Buick, an English engraver and natural history artist who published a history of British birds in two volumes, Land Birds in 1797 and Water Birds in 1804. Buick's illustrations are woodcut engravings, following in that tradition of Mark Catesby and even earlier of George Edwards, and therefore, again, they do not they do have a fully different look from Gwilym's life-size watercolors. However, as is the case with Catesby, we know that she followed Buick's work, referencing him twice in her letters, once to name a specific bird, an owl that she does not depict, and once to specifically request his second volume featuring water birds, which was published years after she had left for India. Gwilym write writes to her family in England saying, quote, 
I wish to have immediately Buick's second volume of British Birds, which I see by the papers is come out. Do not forget it by the first opportunity. And so to my earlier point about the value of comparing visually disparate works, I think it bears considering that Gwilym specifically asked to be sent Buick's book of water, water birds in 1804, when she herself was deep in her own creative process. Here, we can see that Buick's cuckoo and Gwilym's share a pose and an expression, despite the continued difference in medium. My third artist for comparison is by far the most direct contemporary of Gulen that I have found in regards to time, medium, and even gender. As my research currently seeks to understand the British community surrounding the arts and natural history in the years immediately preceding Gulen's departure and subsequent arrival, I found myself looking into exhibitions of natural marvels in London around the 1790s. Perfect encapsulation of this research stage, and hopefully an intriguing note upon which to conclude my talk, rests with the work of Sarah Stone. Stone was an illustrator who painted a great deal of watercolor specimens from the collection of Sir Aston Lever, the founder of the popular Leverian Museum. Her watercolors were advertised and displayed at the museum, as well as included in its catalog. And since we know that Gwilym's contemporary Fanny Burney had seen this collection in London, so too may have Gwilym herself. In this line of thinking, some early but productive comparisons can be made between Stone and Gwilym's work. The vultures seen here, though again different species, share an attention to feather color and texture, specifically around the neck and legs. And there are also similarities between the color patterns of the two green herons. However, the visual detail regarding the placement of each feather is once again higher in Gwilym's work. So as I conclude, here are a few visual aids to significant places that have anchored my thinking. From left to right, we first have the Cathedral of Ely, the city where Sir Henry Gwilym served as a judge before the move to Madras. Secondly, in the center, is Ely House in London, owned by the Bishop of Ely and his wife, Margaret York, known friends and correspondents of the Gwilym. Finally, on the right, an interior of the Leverian Museum as painted by Sarah Stone, featuring many of the displayed birds that might have drawn a connection between her and Gwilym. Putting these two artists in conversation brings up many questions that I hope will guide my coming research. In particular, I'm intrigued by comparing a working class professional like Stone, who earned money as an illustrator in the booming world of natural history books, and thus painted for a vast audience, with an upper middle class hobbyist like Gwilym, who it seems painted only for her family, her teachers, and herself and whose talents might have remained unpublished and forgotten, if not for the fortuitous eye of Casey Wood many decades ago, as well as for the efforts of this collaborative project, which has brought us here together today. I look forward to continuing my research in this vein, and I thank you for your attention. And now I will hand it over to my fellow research assistant, Hannah. Thanks, Serafina. And thanks, Jennifer, for that introduction. Okay. So in this presentation, I speculate about Mary Simmons's four street scenes from the Madras album, each of which depicts a row of Indian individuals and assemblages. Inscriptions on the paintings identify Brahmins and Pandaran priests, and other local features include a palanquin with four bears and a reclining passenger, a white ox pulling an ornate cart, and a group of water buffalo being herded. Seemingly referring to these images, Elizabeth Gwilym, in an 1803 letter, mentions to her sister Hetty that Mary has sent some drawings to England, and, quote, slight as they are, they are by much the best things I ever saw to give an idea of the people in the streets or roads here, in crowds and so various in their dresses. Mary also refers to the scenes in her letters. She notes, for example, that, quote, the carriages of the natives are extremely elegant, particularly the hackery, which is drawn by milk white bullocks. And she writes that there is one in one of these rows. These rows are of interest, however, not simply because they allow us to glimpse how a Madras street may have looked in the early 19th century, but also for their potential engagement with papercraft and optical spectacle, which is what I address today. A letter from Mary, written in or before 1803, 
reveals that these watercolor rows were possibly intended to be cut out and assembled together, uh, forming a three-dimensional representation of a Madras street. As Mary writes to her sister of the rows, I intended to make a great many more and to fix them in a box to represent a street. This method I invented to give you some idea of the population of this country, as they would then be about as thick as the people are here in the streets. Of the four watercolor rows extant today, one of them has been cut out, and that's the one here on the screen. It's possible that Mary cut it out herself or that her sister Hetty started to put together the diorama as Mary described it. There are also two other examples of these pasteboard cutouts in the Madras album. One is captioned the tomb of Ali Hussein, and it's referenced by Elizabeth in an 1803 letter, uh, while another depicts five palanquin bearers. In October 1803, Mary also writes to Hetty that she has made some memorandums of a party and intends to turn them into a pasteboard model. Of her intended street construction, Mary states that she has invented the representational method, and it's this claim that I'm currently exploring. And in this presentation, I offer a few potential candidates for Mary's inspiration. If we assemble a model of what Mary may have had in mind for her cutouts, placing them, as she writes, in a box close together, such that the arrangement is thick in the sense of a crowd on a street, we end up with something like this, a diorama redolent of a miniature theater. It first seems that the obvious point of reference for Mary's concept is the toy or paper theater or juvenile drama popular throughout England in the 19th century. Likewise, similar in their material scale and three-dimensional nature are paper peep shows, contemporaneously popular in England. Um, in some cases, toy theaters and peep shows were likely produced by the same publishers. Toy theaters, however, are attested in England from around 1810 and paper peep shows appear to surface even later around 1820. Both of these traditions in England this significantly post-date Mary's diorama, and consequently we need to look elsewhere for potential reference material. Although Dutch painter and art theorist Samuel van Hoogstraten's 17th century perspective boxes are generally identified as the primary antecedent to most types of three-dimensional optical paper craft, the more direct predecessors to England's 19th century toy theaters and peep shows are likely German publisher Martin Engelbrecht's 18th century paper theaters or perspective views. These are small paper dioramas given the effects of depth and three-dimensionality by paper layers. Engelbrecht's views, despite being prolific and evidently both charming and meticulously crafted, were not widely appropriated. He seems to have been the sole producer of such crafts at the time, which may be due to a royal decree granting him a monopoly on the production of perspective views. Conflicting ideas about the availability of Engelbrecht's views in England, however, make it difficult to discern whether Mary could have come in contact with one. Historian of toy theaters, George Spate, claimed that Engelbrecht's views never made it to England, but art historian Francis Turpak suggests that they did, because some were printed with texts in various languages, including English. With their diminutive size and paper layers, Engelbrecht's perspective views, if they ever ended up in England, may have served as Mary's inspiration for her Madras dioramas. But even if Mary did not chance upon an Engelbrecht view, she may well have seen an English play, the scenery of which, the wings in particular, could also have inspired her production of a three-dimensional layered painted scene. We know Mary to have painted in miniature at, in Madras, as Ben has mentioned, so producing diminutive representations of a life-size world was no unfamiliar pursuit. The scenery of the Georgian theater was dynamic and integral to the performance. Painted scenery demanded attention because it was changed uh, scene to scene in full view of the audience. While painted backdrops stood at the back of the stage in layers, one behind the other, the primary visual effect of layering on the stage occurred in the wings, which consisted of various similar panels, one in front of the other, adding a sense of depth to the play scenery. A surviving model of Georgian layered scenery exists in these stage models by artist and Drury Lane set designer, Philip James de Lutherberg. It's possible thus that Mary took inspiration from the stage itself. Perhaps significantly, Mary writes in early 1803 of being asked by Sir James Strange to sketch illustrations for a book translated by Sir William Jones, which as was also mentioned by Ben and Dr. Raz in the last webinar, was likely the Shakuntala, an Indian drama. The Madras album contains an image labeled seen from a Sanskrit drama that may be one of these illustrations. As such, it's possible that Mary was already accustomed to producing representations that were called theatrical. <laughs> 
Another kind of small-scale theater was also engineered by de Lutherberg, the Ida Fusicon, opened at Leicester Square in 1781 and billed as a show of natural phenomena represented by moving pictures. According to contemporary William H. Pine, the Ida Fusicon's animation comprised dynamic lighting, transparent screens, and pasteboard cutouts. Considering these elements in conjunction with the format of de Lutherberg's model stage sets, we can imagine that the Ida Fusicon also incorporated layering as a means of achieving a sense of depth and three-dimensionality. Other modern day renderings have interpreted it thus. It is possible thus that Mary viewed or at least heard of de Lutherberg's contraption. We know her to have visited London. And we also know that Mary visited London's Exeter Change at which the Ida Fusicon was exhibited in 1785 and 86. The nature of the Ida Fusicon as a miniature theater using pasteboard cutouts, transparencies, and thus likely layers could possibly have inspired Mary's diorama. Integral to the Ida Fuscon's drama were its transparencies, backlit paintings done on translucent materials such as silk, allowing for dynamic lighting effects. These featured on advertisements for the show, and they served both as components of the theater and as entertainment between scenes. Beyond the possibility of Mary's having seen the Ida Fuscon, however, we know her to have met with other transparencies, including during her time in India. And here's just an example of a roughly contemporary transparency. Writing to Hetty in 1802, Mary notes that the Freemasons Grand Ball was decorated with festoons of blue silk and painted transparencies. In 1803, she writes, a farewell ball for Lord Clive also featured transparencies. Her mention of these visuals in a letter home suggests that she was fairly impressed by them and they are often one of the only elements of an event that she reports. Viewing these transparencies may have suggested to Mary the artistic potential to be found in layering images. In conceiving of images as not opaque, two-dimensional, and individual sheets, but rather malleable components to be combined with other elements, in this case light, all visible simultaneously, as we can see is the case with the diorama or perspective view which layers images. Mary also offers no explanation of what a transparency is in her letters, making it clear that they're a familiar sight to both her and her sister back home. Transparencies were popular in late 18th century England, not only as public entertainment, but also as women's genteel pursuits. Jane Austen mentions them in Mansfield Park, for example, as but one of many handicrafts engaged in by the Bertram sisters. In fact, she suggests that the sisters briefly experienced a rage for transparencies. It is thus not unlikely that Mary crafted transparencies herself at home in England. Significantly in relation to the Madras diorama, DIY backlit transparencies, uh, were often produced through the layering of sheets of paper and cutting out of figures. Multiple papers would be fastened together, and then those areas of the image that were supposed to let more light through, such as a moon here, would have more layers of paper cut away. As such, the cutting and layering of paper required for the production of a transparency is not unrelated to the construction Mary had in mind for her Madras street scene view. So, these have been a few potential elements of visual culture that Mary may have, consciously or unconsciously, drawn on in her invention of the layered pasteboard diorama or perspective view. Martin Engelbrecht's perspective views, the layered scenery of the Georgian theater, Philip James of Lutherberg's Adafusicon, and the transparencies that she both saw in Madras and likely previously made herself. Moving forward, I would next like to look into the possibility of Mary having seen architectural models potentially made or used by her architect father, Thomas Simmons, or perhaps something similar to Humphrey Repton's interactive red books as seen here, uh, which had liftable flaps, as well as more Indian visual culture, as Elizabeth does mention backlit transparent paintings at a Hindu fest festival. Uh, so if anyone has any input on the subject, I would greatly appreciate hearing it. And I will hand it back to Jennifer now. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Serafina. It's so exciting to see your research in the development stages and how many connections you've already made. Now, our fourth and final speaker today is Dr. Marika Sardar. Marika is curator at the Aga Khan Museum, Toronto, having previously worked at the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, Qatar, the San Diego Museum of Art, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She's contributed to the exhibition Interwoven Globe, focusing on the worldwide textile trade from the 16th to the 18th century, 
and was co-curator of Sultans of Deccan, India, 1500 to 1750, examining the artistic traditions of the Muslim sultanates of central India. She was also curator of epic tales from ancient India, looking at narrative traditions and the illustration of texts from Southern Asia. Today, Marika will discuss the traditions of natural history painting in India and the Indian context for the work of Elizabeth Gwillem and Mary Simmons. While the natural history drawings and paintings made by the sisters can be understood within the frameworks of European illustration for scientific study and the European systems for classifying animals and plants, Indian painters had for centuries been producing nature studies and there were long-standing conventions for describing and cataloging the natural world in Persian, Arabic, and Sanskrit language sources. It's my pleasure to introduce Marika Sardar. Over to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you to my fellow panelists and to those of you in the audience for uh, sticking it out through all four speakers. So in the interest of uh, surrounding the work of Mary and Elizabeth and their lives in India with information from as many angles as possible, I'm now taking the panel in a slightly different direction, picking up on one subject matter in particular, the natural history paintings, such as the one that Serafina so beautifully presented. I'd like to look at the broader context for these paintings within India itself. Uh, for a while, much has been made about the scientific movement the sisters were trained in and contributed to as a European phenomenon, and the moment in which they were active as a key period in the development of European natural history studies, we are now starting to acknowledge that these advancements, in fact, relied heavily on systems of knowledge local to the places where the animal specimens were being collected, and that they required the support of the people in the lands where the Europeans were making these discoveries. In other words, our work now involves helping these people emerge from the background and into the center of our understanding of the period. Rather than a completed thought, this paper is just the beginning of a journey and more like a set of promises to be kept over the next few months of research. But it does start the work of bringing into the fold of the Gwillem research presentations the Indian background to their enterprise. Whereas the talks to date have focused on the logistics and difficulties of the sisters' journeys to India, on their adaptations to the climate, dress, and cuisine of the subcontinent, and how their endeavors can be understood within the intellectual culture of contemporary British women, we can now round out that picture with an understanding of the traditions that they were meeting in Madras. As I specialize in a period of, Indi of Indian art much earlier than the 1800s, I start this presentation in the 16th century and in Northern India, but as work progresses, I hope to more clearly connect the dots between the production of the art and information I'll be presenting now and the precise time in the early 1800s and place in Southern India where the sisters were located. But I believe this is all still valuable information in the same way that we need to understand the history of European scientific studies behind the moment in which Mary and Elizabeth were making their paintings. On the Indian side, the earliest examples of the type of observation and depiction of plants and animals that I'm aware of that would track to the mode in which sisters were working date to the early 1500s and are found in the diary of Babur, founder of the Mughal dynasty, who lived from 1483 until 1530. The diary was written in Chagatai Turkish and then translated into Persian for Babur's grandson, the Emperor Akbar, in the late 1500s, at which point it was copied and illustrated several times. What you're looking at now, therefore, are pages from different copies of the Persian version of the text with paintings from a later period than that of Babur himself. Thus, I'm not suggesting that we look to these examples of the kind of direct observation and immediate recording that the sisters were doing, but rather as a corollary and general approach. In coming to a new land, Babur was from Fergana and present day Uzbekistan, 
He was quite interested in what he saw in India, and he took note of many things, including the flora and fauna that were unique to this part of the world. He made basic observations about each tree or plant, the shape of its leaves, the fruit it produced, or the area in which it was found, providing enough information that the later artists were able to fill in the images. For animals, he might mention their coloration, size, or the difference between the male and female of the species, again with enough detail that the later artists knew which animals to depict. In this example, showing two blue nilgai, or blue-haired antelope, the accompanying text states, the nilgai is as tall but more slender than a horse. The male is blue, which is probably why it is called a nilgai. It has two smallish horns. On its throat, it has hair longer than a span that resembles a yak tail. Its hooves are like those of the, a cow. The female's color is like that of a doe and it has no horns or hair on its throat. The female is also plumper than the male. In the period of Babur's grandson Akbar, who ruled from 1556 until 1605, we have paintings that isolate the animals from this narrative framing showing them by themselves, sometimes within a landscape setting and sometimes against a plain ground. These paintings have been cut down from their original folios and pasted into albums with new borders. Therefore, we don't know the original context for their creation, but they were made at around the same time as the illustrations to Babur's memoirs that we were just examining, and similarly appear to be making an attempt at documentation rather than simply depicting the animals as background decoration to outdoor scenes. For certain, all of the species in the uh, individual folios, as well as in the paintings in the Babur Nama manuscripts can be identified, which says much about how the upper period artists must have been working and which must have involved sketching from direct observations of the plants and animals depicted. In terms of format, things start to move closer to the kind of documentary painting the sisters were making during the reign of Akbar's son Jahangir, that is to say between 1605 and 1627. He rather famously charged artists with creating images of plants and animals when traveling, starting during a particular trip to Kabul in 1606. And this is all documented in quite some detail by Abba Koch and other scholars. As a result, his artists started to observe and paint animals in the wild, but also made studies from those captured and brought to the court. In the case of the image on screen now, for instance, we have a note in Persian, which states that the bird, a spotted fork tail, was drawn at life size from a bird which the servants had hunted in Jangaspur and whose likeness his majesty had ordered to be drawn by the artist known as Nadir Azaman, who is Abul Hassan. We don't have a record of Jahangir or Abul Hassan ever traveling to Jangaspur in the Himalayas where this bird is found. And so it might've been brought to wherever the artist was then stationed. There are many indications, in fact, that Jahangir men maintained a menagerie where animals were kept and even bred and apparently painted. Again, that documentary urge must be noted. I find it particularly interesting that the inscription states the bird was drawn to scale. In real life, these birds are about 25 centimeters long. And while I couldn't find the dimensions uh, for the painting itself online, the folio is 38.6 centimeters wide, which means the image of the bird is actually probably right around 25 centimeters. The artist Mansour is perhaps most closely linked with this period of development. And you can see why when we look at the painting signed or attributed to him. This painting of the great hornbill, for instance, demonstrates his skill in rendering the bird's feathers, the pterilography that Serafina mentioned, uh, their positioning and the subtle variation in their colors. We also note the feet, how the unusual bill was captured and many other details. And in this regard, to bring in the Aga Khan collection, I will note that this particular painting has been copied a number of times, including an example now here in Toronto, 
Mansour was such a highly respected artist that there are dozens of works made after his or later inscribed with his name as in the example also in our collection on the right. But to examine Mansour's achievements more thoroughly, we can turn back to his known works. For example, this painting, which depicts the Nilgai, the blue antelope we encountered earlier in the illustrations to Babur's memoirs. The importance of accurately portraying its every physical characteristic is evident again in the details, which so show everything from the distinctive swirl of hair where its neck meets its body to the precise characteristics of its horns and ears. Though I will say that the detail of the hair could also be seen in the earlier Babur Nama painting. That Mansour developed this mode of painting specifically for the animal studies can be seen in comparison to his other known works or indeed uh, for Abul Hassan and his other paintings. These are more typical of the type of manuscript illustration prevalent across the Islamic world in which the paint is applied in several opaque colors and the figures are indicated with minimal modeling or sh shading. The end of Jahangir's reign seems to mark the end of an interest in these kinds of plant and animal studies. After this period, the later Mughal emperors don't appear to have followed this up, except for examples such as this, a portrait as it is described in the inscription of this um, image of a particular named elephant, though it could be plausibly proposed that this is more a recording of a significant acquisition than the studies of a, the characteristics of a species. And we do see flowers um, being depicted in quite some detail in architecture, textiles, and so on during the period of Shah, uh, Shah Jahan, but again, I would put those in a separate category. Nonetheless, by the time that Europeans settling in the subcontinent in the late 18th century were looking to find Indian artists who could make sets of paint animal paintings for them, this heritage was still alive enough for those artists to step extremely capably into that role. If the Mughal paintings and written records I've presented were organized in anecdotal fashion, depending on what caught the eye of the observer, or what was brought to him rather than representing a systematic survey of a particular area or of a family of animals, we can see in operation and parallel to these kinds of works from the Mughal court, another way of understanding the natural world that did involve a system of organization, albeit one distinct from that which developed in Europe in the 18th to 19th centuries. In India, these kinds of works came out of two initially separate scientific traditions. For the Persian and Arabic speakers, there would have been a set of works from across the Islamic world that were ultimately derived from Greek sources, but that updated and translated them. Examples include the 11th century text by Ibn Bakhtishu called On the Usefulness of Animals. This text is a compendium of different species organized into classes such as domestic and wild quadrupeds, birds, fishes, and insects. For each animal, a short text is provided, the first part always giving its principal characteristics and its habits, and the second discussing how it may be put to use in ways that benefit humans. These examples are from a well-known translation of Ibn Bakhtishu's text made in Iran circa 1300, and they are typical of this kind of treatise and its illustration. On the left, under the heading concerning the uses of the green magpie, the text describes the habits and properties of the bird, namely that it always tries to eat flies, its droppings boiled up with gall oak and fat will blacken mustaches, and low quality gold will increase its carat value if placed under the bird and allowed to warm up. I couldn't find uh, suitable images in the public domain from Indian manuscript copies of this text to share with you. So you'll just have to trust me that the, this kind of work uh, or its derivatives were in fact circulating in India. In a similar vein, we have Arabic language versions of Dioscorides writings on the medicinal value of different plants, such as the example on the left made in Iraq at the turn of the 13th century, or the example on the right from India in the first half of the 17th century. Like the texts on animals, these studies of plants focus on the uses to which they might be put. 
Another strand of writing that seeks to illustrate and organize plants and animals are works of cosmology. The most prominent of this kind of text, copied hundreds of times across the Islamic world, is known as the wonders of creation and the oddities of existing things, written in the mid 13th century by the author Al Kazvini. The text has two parts, one dealing with the planets, constellations, and angels, and a second that has to do with matters on earth, the four elements, the seven climes, and the three kingdoms of nature, which would be the animal, vegetable, and mineral. The animal kingdom itself is divided into seven categories, man's, spirits, animals used for mounting and riding, grazing animals, beasts, birds, insects, and the fantastical. Again, I show an example from the AKM collection, along with an Indian example to demonstrate the fact that the text was in fact copied there and continued to be relevant up to the period we focus on in the Gwilym project. Another strand of scientific thought to consider would be writings in Sanskrit and other Indian languages, or indeed the kinds of information about the habits of animals or the uses of plants that were passed down outside of written texts. This is, however, a further afield from my typical area of research and remains a subject for further investigation. At this point, it would be a fair question to ask if any of the types of work I've mentioned were available in Southern India to the Indians with whom the sisters were working or more broadly to the artists and local experts working with the British in any number of Indian centers. I started to look into this question and have several leads to follow up still, and of course would be interested in hearing any suggestions in this regard. One useful starting point is the library of Tipu Sultan, the ruler of Mysore until 1799, which has been studied to a certain degree. From one inventory, for instance, we know that he had at least 45 books on, with different sciences, and that he even had a notebook documented by Henry Nolte, who is part of the Gwilym research team, of notes on botany lectures given in Edinburgh. What I'm interested to see, though, is whether the Arabic and Persian classics uh, would have formed part of his collection, and I have a strong suspicion that they do, given the nature of his other holdings. Another question would be whether we really can see any points of connection between the type of study implied in the Indian images and texts, and that being built up in Europe in the late 19th to early 19th, uh, late 18th to early 19th century. For sure, the many differences would at first be obvious. What we have just seen does not represent an attempt at a taxonomy of the species native to a given geographical area in the way that the European studies do. The focus seems to be instead on fostering an appreciation for God's creations, given the variety and usefulness of living things that he has created. Yet the building blocks of inquiry do have much in common. Given the degree of detail and the desire to document uh, that is inherent in these paintings. In future work, I would like to pursue this further, but this is more in the realm of the history of science and the history of art and of it daunting task at the moment. However, there's much new work being done now on collections of natural history paintings in Malaysia or South America and many other places, being done by Daniela Bleichmar or, or our own Benita Damodaran and Anna Winterbottom and the scholars included in their volume, The East India Company and the Natural World. And these do point the way to a framework for seeing how local forms of knowledge fed into the European endeavor, and indeed for seeing this as a global endeavor since there were contributions being made on nearly every continent at this time. Thank you. And now I will pass back to Jennifer. Thank you, Marika. What a fascinating look at the local knowledge and those beautiful Arabic and Persian manuscripts. I'd like to invite our four speakers to turn on their cameras and we'll begin our question period. There's been an interesting uh, conversation going on in the chat about the, the transparent mica paintings. Thank you for everyone who's contributed. Um, a reminder that if you have questions, you can add them to the chat, address it to all panelists, and I'll, I'll read out your questions. Um, 
one interesting question that came in while we were speaking um, for all panelists really, what about looking at the paper that the sisters were working with? Is it possible to, to date the paper, to date the materials more precisely looking at the history of paper? I think maybe I can answer to some degree due to my attention to Elizabeth's work specifically. This actual name escapes me at the moment, but she does often name the brands or the company of the um, artist supplies that she's requesting from back home. So that would certainly be a good lead to follow to find like where was she sourcing them from? Do they have specific production dates for types of paper? Um, on the other end, I'm not sure how one would go about, you know, figuring out what sort of paper a potential object is on. That might be something a curator or a conservator could help with. But the detail, though not abundant, does exist to some degree within the letters to offer us, I think, enough specifics to at least start on that path. Yeah, so paper and watercolor is uh, like a really intimate relationship. So. Um, there are two kind of main types of paper at this time, woven and laid. Um, and laid is a nightmare because it basically forms a mesh work in the paper. So it's really hard for watercolors to, to run and fill on. So it's actually the development of, um, of woven paper is really important for the kind of boom in watercolor uh, art that we're talking about. And so like Serafina says, things like Bristol paper was a huge thing that everyone wanted and just couldn't get their, their hands on. So we're starting to look at paper and hopefully um, that will give us some clues because there are lots of references in the letters to, I think I mentioned that, you know, Mary says she can't do landscapes, for example, because she just doesn't have enough paper to, to do landscapes on. Um, and so they're using all kinds of odds and sods. Um, but paper is really fascinating at this time. So the, I think it was the Royal Society for Watercolour Artists about this time patents or like has approved, like if you can imagine a really thick, linen paper because apparently that was going to be the best thing for for watercolor uh painting on and they mentioned things like vellum stones and things so um it's a really good idea and a really good question and hopefully in a few months time we might we might have a bit more information speaking of paper i'm interested to know the experience especially of our research assistants of working uh, exclusively with virtual materials, you don't have the opportunity to handle those papers. Can you describe your experience? Yeah, it's been very different from my past experience um, working with art objects in museums. It definitely leaves something to be desired, obviously wishing you could look at them and perhaps to some degree handle the, the watercolors. For me, the biggest difficulty has been the knowledge that most of these birds are life-size, paint to scale, but I've only ever interacted with them on the 14 inch surface of my laptop. So that's kind of been hard for me to grapple with the materiality of Elizabeth's process and how she would have set up her, her painting uh, station, how big these birds were that she was interacting with physically and artistically. So. There's always a hope one day I'll be able to cross the border back and see them. I suppose on the flip side, you have the benefit of, of zooming in on fine brush details. Yeah, and I've been very fortunate that the McGill objects exist in very high quality. So yeah, that's been beneficial. And what about you, Hannah, working uh, in the virtual environment? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the benefit of working in the virtual environment is really that the images that I'm looking at are held in Norwich and Ben's collection. So were I in Montreal, I wouldn't be able to see them anyway. And so working with something digital is nice in the sense because I'm able to work with objects that are, you know, not in, not in my immediate vicinity. But um, yeah, like, like Serafina said, and like you mentioned, definitely zooming in has been always useful. Of course, it's something working with some of the images in the McGill collection, Mary Simmons is probably her fish paintings. For those, it's been particularly useful to be able to zoom in and look at sort of individual brush strokes and um, sort of use those specific details to try to identify a specific style. But um, yeah, otherwise, I mean, <laughs> when I sort of tried to make this little model perspective view, it, it was nice to sort of print something out and have paper to work with and sort of feel something material for once. But um, otherwise, it's been certainly strange, but also I think as an art history student, 
in this age, <laughs> not too out of the ordinary. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we have a question for Ben. You mentioned that there was a third artist who contributed to the album. Any ideas who that might be? Uh, I'm afraid it's a, a, a brief answer and, and at this stage, no, I mean, the next stage is to look through all of their correspondence and try and find people that could maybe have a, be a fit. And there are also some letters from other people that mention, for example, Mary uh, in them, but uh, I think it's going to be really hard to pin down, but we'll, we'll have a go. Thank you. Um, Serafina, you mentioned the, the value of the correspondence of Fanny Burney in particular. Um, do you think that there might be diaries of other women writing at the period that you might start to explore in the next phase? I think so, absolutely. It's, I really am trying to focus on this very specific time in London, these 1790s and the exhibits that were there. And as with the Laveria Museum, there's the British Museum and there's many of the societies, both the Royal, uh, Royal Society and the Society of Artists. And it was very much a social thing to, to circulate among these exhibits and to talk about them and compare and contrast. And so I have to imagine, and I really have to hope that there are many young women writing about these experiences. Um, certainly the British Library and British Museum would be a place for me to start looking for that. Thank you. Um, we also have a question for Marika. Could you tell us more about Tipu Sultan's library and where did it end up after the looting? Sure, it was pretty widely diver uh, dispersed, um, but Ursula Sims Williams, for instance, is someone who's been working on um, what happened to uh, the collections because a large portion of them uh, ended up in the British Library where she was based. Uh, there's another uh, group of works um, in uh, the Royal Asiatic Society. And then there are many individual objects that we can trace. I know, for instance, of one um, illustrated manuscript in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. So um, there was a moment where things were sort of um, recorded just after uh, he was killed and, and the palace was stormed. Uh, but then, um, you know, in the several hundred years since then, they've really traveled far and wide. Thank you, Marika. Um, Serafina, a question directed at you. Can you talk a little bit more about the significance of Ely? Yeah, Ely has been quite the, quite the place for me to conceptualize my research. And I, I tend to think in locations when I'm trying to pull all this abstract historical information into something cohesive. So the sisters were born and raised in Herefordshire. But then once Elizabeth had married Sir Henry Gwillem, he was appointed a judge in Ely. So that was kind of, at least how I understand it, the place where they moved as a married couple for his first professional appointment. And I imagine it was there that they became such good friends with the Bishop of Ely and his wife, um, Margaret York. And they correspond quite fondly to each other. Uh, Elizabeth says when they were in Portsmouth awaiting their ship to Madras, they went to a ball with uh, the Bishop and Mrs. Uh, York and socialized there. And the reason they're so relevant, I think, is because uh, there's also Ely House in London on Dover Street, and that was where the Bishop of Ely and Margaret York would stay when they went to visit the town. And we have in a letter from Margaret York a note saying that Elizabeth, after she had moved to Madras, sent her a great Argus pheasant. And this bird was, I think, stuffed and put on display in Ely House in London. Um, and Margaret York also makes the note that it's one of three great Argus pheasants in England at the time, the other one of which is located at Sir Ashton Lever's Lavarian Museum. And so Ely was a very great jumping off point, kind of hopping from Herefordshire to Ely to London to Madras to kind of conceptualize another one of Elizabeth's networks, specifically, I think, one that provides uh, social backing for her interaction with the world in London, as well as just a little information about her life and her friendships. 
Wonderful, thank you. Um, Marika, um, there's a question. Would you tell us something more about the Mughal School of Natural History and how, or indeed, if it influenced the East India Company? Sure, I guess that is the central question I'm, I'm trying to uh, figure out right now. Um, but really my point was to say that um, this type of observation um, had existed in India um, for a long time before the artists we see who are either working with the, um, you know, companies era painting uh, patrons um, or, uh, you know, at the same time that the um, British or other European uh, artists were active in, in um, sort of documenting the wildlife of India. So, so far, I feel that um, the way the, this moment of discovery is, is documented and written about um, doesn't uh, look to these longer traditions uh, within the area. So I'm trying to bring that up um, and more fully integrate it into our understanding of how artists um, and scientists were working at this time. But right at the moment, there isn't sort of a, a direct correlation that we can see, um, though much has been said um, perhaps about the European influences and what uh, was available to the artists, say, of Jahangir's period in terms of herbals and the prints uh, that Mansur was looking at if we uh, turn to his many flower studies. Um, I think this is really a complex moment of interaction and uh, one we just need to reset our framework for how we understand. So more to come. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. And that is, what was the Gwilym sisters' attitude to Indian art and the artworks by Indian artists? Is that um, something that came out through the correspondence? Thank you, Ben. Yeah, so I, I, I can start, I guess. I mean, I think um, on one hand, um, uh, with art specifically, I mean, it's hard to know generally. So, um, for example, lots of um, paintings in southern India have incredible mural traditions in them, but we don't know a huge amount of how the sisters interacted with those. But we do get the sense of wonder that, for example, uh, Elizabeth has when she's given this book of, of miniatures, which I mentioned, uh, which include um, uh, well, she says Hindu stories, which was presumably some kind of uh, miniature album with them um, really nicely uh, decorated leaves and, and borders, perhaps a little bit like some of the slides that Marika showed earlier. Um, but also I think a sense of curiosity. So not just uh, fine art, but thinking about how um, they were really, really interested in murals that would appear on houses, for example, at the time of Diwali. So this time of year, um, which still happens across, across India. Um, so you get a sense of them engaging not only with 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 high art, where our, our our kind of information is perhaps a little bit sketchier, but kind of everyday arts as well. So kind of mural traditions, uh, everything through to textiles, lanterns, transparencies, um, and so you kind of a range of a sense of wonder to, to to curiosity. It would be fascinating to know, for example, if they had because um, they really they've got good relationships with people like so Dr. Anderson uh, in Madras one of his students goes on to become the Raja of Tanjore so there could be really close links between what's happening across southern India and the sisters and we know lots of artists were employed in, in Tanjore for example for, for the Raja but um, a little bit more work needs to be done on that but anyway I'm sure other people might have have other other things to say. Thank you Ben I think it's time for us to wrap up here's Victoria returning to give thanks to all of our speakers. Um, really a fascinating presentation from all of you today. Thank you for bringing the Sisters Madras to life for us today. Victoria, well, back to you. Oh, yes, thank you all. It was absolutely riveting and I'm really looking forward to the continuing research. So I wanna thank all the attendees for attending the session of Gwilym Online and we'll look forward to wel welcoming you to our upcoming final presentation. Please mark your calendars for the next session on Tuesday, December 1st at 9 a.m. Montreal time. It's a discussion of architecture and the environment featuring Professor Vikram Bhatt of McGill, Professor Vinita Damodoran from the Institute for World Environmental History at the University of Sussex, 
which is a project partner, and Dr. A. Srivatsan, who has very kindly agreed to be the moderator for this session. He is a historian of the urban and architectural history of Madras. Merci de votre présence aujourd'hui, and we look forward to welcoming you again in two weeks to the very final session of Guillem Online. Thank you. <laughs>